Okay. Hello and welcome to our webinar on Maryland ABLE. My name is Stacy Taylor. I'm with the Parents Place of Maryland. I'll be your moderator for today's presentation from Lori Markland from Maryland ABLE. For those of you who may not be as familiar with Parents Place, I wanted to take a moment to share a little bit about us. PPMD's mission is to empower families as advocates and partners in improving education and health outcomes for their children with disabilities and special health care needs. We do this by being Maryland's Parent Training and Information Center, Family to Family Health Information Center, as well as the state affiliate of Family Voices. We're mostly funded through federal and state grants. We've been in operation for over 25 years. We are a family founded and run organization and we assist families to navigate the education and healthcare system. We do this by providing one-on-one -on -one assistance for families, information and resources for families and providers, workshops and training for families and providers statewide, parent leadership development, and we work and advocate to promote systems change to improve services for families of children and youth with special health care needs and disabilities. If you'd like more information about PPMD and our services, please go to our website at www.ppmd.org, like us on Facebook, or give us a call. Today's guest speaker is Lori Markland. Lori is the Communications and Marketing Manager for the Maryland ABLE Program. In this role, she coordinates the communications, outreach, marketing, and development strategies for the program, a statewide investment program for people with disabilities. ABLE investment plans allow individuals with disabilities to save money and build assets over the $2,000 cap associated with SSI while maintaining federal and state means-tested benefits. Previously, Lori served as the Director of Communications Outreach and Program Development with the Maryland Department of Disabilities Technology Assistance Program. Lori holds a BA and MFA from the University of Baltimore. Welcome, Lori. I'm going to turn the presentation over to you now, and we will go ahead and proceed. All right, great. Thank you. So I think you're going to have to do the next slide for me. Okay. There we go. So thank you guys for joining today and taking a little bit of time to learn about the Maryland ABLE program. Um, Stacy summed up really nicely what the ABLE program is. And what I wanna do today is talk about what the Maryland program looks like, what it looks like on a national level, and what it looks like um, as it's been implemented in the state. Next slide, please. So the Maryland ABLE program is essentially an opportunity for individuals to set money aside in a savings account or an investment account without jeopardizing the state and federal means tested benefits that are so critical to so many individuals with disabilities. When I talk about means tested benefits, I'm talking about things such as SSI, SSDI, Medicaid, waiver services. All of those are critical benefits. And for many individuals with disabilities, when you are receiving those benefits, you cannot have a lot of assets. Um, typically it's $2,000 is the cap on assets that you can have at which point you lose access to those critical benefits. And what that's done over the course of time is it's created a cycle where individuals cannot have assets, so they're essentially forced to live at a state of poverty so they can continue to receive critical benefits that keep them at a state of poverty, and there's no real opportunity to break out of that system. So about 10 years ago, a group of parents in Virginia got together and started brainstorming opportunities or ways in which they could create a savings account for their children with disabilities so that their children could have some financial security, but also continue to receive benefits. And what they did is they created what's called the ABLE program, the Achieving a Better Life Experience Act. Uh, next slide. And when they did this, they, um, they lobbied pretty hard for it, and they were able to get President Obama to sign it into law in 2014. 
So President Obama signed this into law, and essentially it stated that every state has the opportunity to create an ABLE program. This federal legislation outlined some guidelines, and we'll talk about what those guidelines are, but it essentially stated that every state has the opportunity to create this ABLE program, and it was signed into the IRS tax code under the 529 section. So sometimes we are called 529A accounts for ABLE. Um, we are, here in Maryland, we're housed with the Maryland 529 program, and the 529 programs across the country are the college savings plans. So there are some similarities for every state that has an ABLE program. There will be some similarities between their ABLE program and their 529 college savings plan, but there are also distinct differences. So this was signed into federal law in 2014, then Governor Hogan signed it into Maryland law in 2016. So between April 2016 and the end of November 2017, the Maryland 529 program, along with coordinating with the Department of Disabilities and some other agencies, really worked to develop what this ABLE program would look like here in Maryland. And we officially launched on uh, November 28th of 2017. And in the short couple of weeks that we've been open, we have already exceeded over a million dollars in assets under management. We have nearly 400 accounts open. So we are by and large one of the more robust ABLE programs in the nation. And I think part of that is because of the structure of our program, um, some of the incentives we offer for state residents. And we'll look at all of those features. Next slide, please. So what are ABLE accounts? I kind of summed that up when I said there, um, an account in which you can save money and still continue to receive critical benefits because that's very different than the way the whole system has been set up in the past. So sometimes we call this disruptive innovation because it really is an innovative way for people to start having some financial security while still maintaining all of those things that they may need day to day to survive. ABLE accounts are a um, way to invest your funds without jeopardizing those critical benefits. They are a place where you can put money aside and you can grow those earnings tax-free. You can withdraw your funds from this account tax-free as long as it's used for qualified disability expenses. It is a place to easily enroll. So these are online accounts. You don't have to go to a brick and mortar bank you can go online to our website, and we'll look at that in a little bit, and have the opportunity within 10 to 15 minutes to open up your account. And it is a place where you can easily access your funds. So you take that 15 minutes, you go online, you set up your ABLE account, you get it ready to go, you transfer some money into it, and then when you need to access those funds for those qualified disability expenses, you can log back into your account, withdraw those funds directly into your personal checking or savings account, and you have the money there. So again, you put money into this account, you're growing it tax-free, and you're withdrawing that money tax-free as long as it's for a disability-related expense. Next slide, please. The key features of the ABLE plan, and this is based on the federal law. Right now, the total contributions into an ABLE account is capped at $15,000. So you can contribute up to $15,000 into an ABLE account per calendar year. You can save up to $100,000 in the ABLE account before it impacts the SSI cash benefit. So this is a critical piece to remember. You can put money into your ABLE account. But if you are a recipient of SSI, you want to be mindful of the fact that when your account finally hits $100,000, once that balance is at $100,000, your SSI cash benefit is temporarily suspended. Now, these, re these accounts get reported to Social Security monthly. So we report it in, let's say, the month of February that the account has reached $100,000 that March cash benefit will be suspended. When we report the account at the end of March, 
and it shows that the account balance has dropped back down below $100,000, then the April cash benefit resumes. So the only thing that's really impacted is the SSI cash benefit. If you are an SSDI recipient, if you are not receiving SSI, but just other benefits, then you don't need to worry about this $100,000 cap. But if you are receiving SSI or might be receiving it in the future, that's something to keep in mind. And again, you can save in this account without jeopardizing your state or federal means tested benefits. We mentioned SSI, SSDI, Medicaid, <clears throat> excuse me, but that also includes waiver services, food assistance, housing assistance, vocational rehab services. So all of those services stay in place regardless of the amount you have in the ABLE account. And again, there are no federal or state taxes on the earnings in these accounts or on the withdrawals from these accounts provided we're using them for qualified disability expenses. Next slide, please. So what are qualified disability expenses? This is directly from the language of the law. It includes health, prevention, and wellness, housing, so that could be rent, mortgage, property taxes, education, employment training and support, transportation, basic living expenses, assistive technology, financial management, legal fees, expenses for oversight and monitoring, funeral and burial expenses. So this is really broad. This covers a wide array of things for which you can use your ABLE money. A good rule of thumb is that if you are making a withdrawal and that money is going to be used for the individual with the disability, for the beneficiary of the account, then chances are you can make a good case that it falls under one of these categories. Now, an individual can pull funds from their ABLE account and they can buy clothes. They can pay to take an Uber to go out to eat. They can use the funds to buy a new iPad or iPhone. All of those things are qualified expenses provided the withdrawal is used to purchase something for the beneficiary. Now, they can't withdraw those funds and buy things for other people. So the money needs to be spent on the individual. There are no able police officers. So there is nobody monitoring your account telling you that it is, yes, an acceptable approved withdrawal or it is not. It is really up to the account manager, the person managing this account, to make sure that when they make that withdrawal that it falls under one of these qualified disability expenses. Um, I would advise that folks save their receipts. We do know or have been told that the IRS is randomly going to audit a certain number of ABLE account holders each year. It hasn't happened yet, but we have been told that it will. So save the receipts. If you're making withdrawals from your ABLE account, just save the receipts for when you spend the money so that you can show, you know, at least to some degree, what those funds are used for. Next slide, please. Now, there's some criteria to become eligible to open this account. The first is that the individual has to have developed a disability prior to the age of 26. So the individual doesn't have to have had a formal diagnosis before that age, but there has to have been manifestations of the disability before that age. So that's something to keep in mind, um, especially for older adults who may have more recently been diagnosed with autism, but certainly manifested um, or exhibited signs that there was an autism diagnosis prior to them becoming an adult, they can certainly go back and use documentation to show that there were manifestations of that disability. Um, they may not have had that formal diagnosis till later, but if there were manifestations then they could in part qualify for the ABLE account. So again, it just has to have developed before the age of 26. Now this number is in part tied to the age at which someone could stay on their parents' health insurance through the Affordable Care Act. 
It was also the most palatable number for the Congressional Budget Office when they were looking at the cost of this program for the federal government, because presumably the government is going to take a loss on taxes that they would otherwise that it would otherwise receive um, for money sitting aside. So um, that's where that number comes from right now. And there is some proposed legislation to increase that age limit. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. But the second part, um, or second element of their criteria that the individual needs to meet is that they need to meet Social Security's definition of having a disability. The easiest way to do that is to show that you're already receiving SSI or SSDI. Once you're receiving that, you can pretty clearly say, yes, yeah, Social Security has deemed that I meet that level of definition. However, if you're not receiving SSI or SSDI, and that could be for any number of reasons, you can provide a disability certification. Now, our website has a simple form. It's a checkoff form that you would print it off, you would check off the primary disability that the individual has, and it would need to be signed by a licensed physician. And you would need to have that available when you open your ABLE account, because at some point you'll be prompted to upload it or to later mail it in, submit it, um, so that you can show that there is in fact a certified disability, even if you are not actively receiving SSI or SSDI. Next slide, please. And there's only one ABLE account per individual. So unlike a college savings account where there might be one beneficiary and three or four college plans, or college savings accounts set up for that one person, this is a little bit different. It is one ABLE account per individual, and it is tied to that individual's social security number. So Maryland happened to be the 29th state to launch the ABLE program. Before we launched, there were a number of Maryland residents that were anxious to get these accounts open for good reason. And so they opened their accounts in other states that accepted national enrollment. So a lot of what we've been doing over the past few weeks is helping those individuals roll those accounts from that, from that other state into the Maryland plan. And there are benefits to having a Maryland plan when you are a Maryland resident, we'll look at that. But that's something to keep in mind. You can't have an ABLE account open in Virginia and also in Maryland. You may only have one account open. Maryland does accept national enrollment so you can live in another state and have a Maryland plan. Um, but certainly for many states, they offer incentives for their in-state residents. And that's always something you want to scope out. And these accounts are owned and operated by the individual with the disability. So it's a little bit different than a special needs trust. So a special needs trust is established um, on behalf of someone typically Funds are um, dispersed on behalf of that individual, that beneficiary. The beneficiary doesn't have a lot of interaction with the money in the trust. ABLE accounts are different. ABLE accounts really are owned and operated by the beneficiary. There are a few instances when they are not. If the child is under the age of 18, certainly the parents or another family member would be the one that opens that account and manages it on behalf of the child. Um, however, if we're talking about someone over the age of 18 who has a disability but is not capable of managing the ABLE account on their own, in that case, they need what's called an authorized legal representative. And an authorized legal representative would be either someone who maintains legal guardianship over the beneficiary or power of attorney over the beneficiary. And when you go to open your ABLE account, you need to keep that in mind because when you go to open the ABLE account, it will ask, is the account being opened by the beneficiary or is the account being opened by an authorized legal representative? And if it's being opened by an authorized legal representative, the system is going to prompt that individual to upload their documents. 
showing that they do have power of attorney or legal guardianship. Now, one of the one of the um, complications that we've had, or things that we've been trying to work through nationally, this is all able programs, is the question of someone who is a rep payee. So, for many adults with disabilities, they have rep payees in place, and a rep payee is a person who manages their social security funds um, on behalf of the beneficiary. By legal definition, a rep payee is someone who manages only social security funds. So being a rep payee does not automatically make you an authorized legal representative. If you are a rep payee, you can pursue legal guardianship or power of attorney for that beneficiary. But by nature of being a rep payee, that in and of itself doesn't make you a legal representative. Now, what we offer on our website is a limited power of attorney form. So let's say there's a situation in which a mom is serving as a rep payee for her adult child with a disability. She can sit down with her child and complete this limited power of attorney form. It's about six pages long. Um, essentially, the beneficiary for the ABLE account consents to allow someone else to manage their ABLE account for them. So that beneficiary signs off, that um, the person that they're appointing signs off, and then they get it notarized. At that point, they would submit the paperwork and that limited power of attorney would allow the individual managing the account to just manage the account on behalf of the beneficiary. Next slide. There is also what is sometimes referred to as the Medicaid payback. When the federal law was written, it stated that a state Medicaid program may make a claim on an ABLE account if the ABLE account was open and the individual was receiving Medicaid services and then that individual passes away. Now, the language of the federal law says that a state may make a claim, not that a state must. So there are a number of states that have worked to pursue legislation saying that they will not, the state Medicaid program will not make any efforts of recovery of funds from the ABLE account. Maryland has also pursued legislation. It has already been presented to both the House and Senate. And so we are waiting to see what happens, but we're pretty hopeful that this will pass. Um, so we'll see where that goes in the future in the next couple of weeks. Certainly, you can stay in touch with us if this is something you have questions about or would like to follow closely. Um, but we are hopeful that the, the legislation will pass, essentially stating that the state Medicaid program, Maryland Medicaid, will not pursue any recovery effort on an ABLE account um, if that individual passes away and was receiving Medicaid services when their account was open. Next slide. I did mention that these accounts are different from a special needs trust. Now, both special needs trusts and ABLE accounts have very, have very specific and individual roles, and they can be vital to a family and to an individual. So certainly you can have both a special needs trust and an ABLE account, but there are some distinct differences, and what I want to do is outline those for just a minute. The first is that an ABLE account is relatively inexpensive to open. It costs $25 to get your account open. And that's not a, a fee, that is just $25 to get your account open. And a special needs trust can typically cost a couple thousand dollars to get the trust established and funded. ABLE accounts have very broad spending power. So you can use money in your ABLE account to pay for things such as housing. Also, the beneficiary of the ABLE account can make contributions to the ABLE account, unlike a special needs trust where typically the beneficiary of the trust cannot put money into the trust. An ABLE account is very accessible. Again, it's a lot like online banking. So you are logging into your account, you are putting money into it by linking up your another bank account to do transfers into, you can make withdrawals from the account quickly, accessibly, easily online. And there are no state or federal taxes on the earnings in these accounts. 
So those are all distinct differences between an ABLE account and a special needs trust. A special needs trust can do things such as house real property. So certainly for families that are looking at long-term ways in which they can support their family member, um, a special needs trust may be really helpful for certain components and an ABLE account could be helpful for other things. So that's just something to keep in mind. Next slide. So where is Maryland at? When we were first signed into legislation in 2016, the Maryland 529, which again is the college savings plans in Maryland, um, the Maryland 529 board created a subcommittee. And it's a, an ABLE subcommittee comprised of 529 board members. It also includes the secretary for the Department of Disabilities. And this subcommittee started looking at a variety of ways in which Maryland could implement this program that would be quick, that would not be costly, it wouldn't be fee heavy to Maryland residents, and would allow the state to really maintain as much control over the various investments as possible. And after looking at a bunch of different options and evaluating these various options and bringing in third parties, um, to review and make recommendations, it was determined that we were going to partner with the state of Oregon. Oregon already had an ABLE program up and running, and the benefit of partnering with Oregon is that we would immediately have access to their program manager. When I talk about program manager, what that is, is it is the bank that manages these accounts. So through our partnership with Oregon, we had access to Bank of New York Mellon, what I call BNY Mellon. And so that management relationship or that program manager relationship allowed us to really get these accounts up and running quickly. It also provided us access to Vanguard investments. So those are strong investment options. Maryland has the off opportunity or the option if they are not to perform well that we can change those investments in the future if we need to. But it allowed us the opportunity to sort of quickly have this template for a program. We could keep our fees relatively low. We actually some of the lowest fees in the nation and get this plan up and running quickly. So that was key to us getting the Maryland program up. Next slide. What does the Maryland plan look like? First, we follow those federal guidelines that we talked about earlier. You can contribute up to $15,000 in an account per calendar year. You can save up to $100,000 in that account before it impacts the SSI cash benefit. And certainly you can save without jeopardizing state or federal means tested benefits. And that's a wide variety of things like SSI, SSDI, Medicaid, food assistance, housing assistance, waiver services, voc rehab services. So all of those benefits uh, will remain in place regardless of the amount of money that is in the ABLE account. Maryland also allows an individual to save up to $350,000 in their ABLE account if they are not worried about that $100,000 SSI cap. So if, for example, if you have a working adult with a disability who is not receiving SSI. They can save up to $350,000 in this account because they're not worried about that SSI cap. Or let's say you have um, a mom and dad who are opening this account for a child who was newly diagnosed with autism. They don't know for sure whether or not that child's going to need SSI in the future. Probably not, but you know who knows? They can, if they so choose, save up to $350,000 in this account. They just want to be mindful of the fact that if that child does need to access SSI in the future, if they had more than $100,000 in their ABLE account, they wouldn't have access to the SSI cash benefit. To get back to the $350,000 amount, you can save up to $350,000 in this account. Once the account balance hits 
$350,000, no additional contributions can be made to it, but it can continue to grow. So depending on the investment you've chosen, it will, you know, have the opportunity to grow above that $350,000. Um, you just can't make any additional contributions in. Next slide, please. The Maryland account features, again, where some of the more competitive feature, or we have some of the more competitive rates across the nation. It costs $25 to establish your account. That is not a fee. That is your money. It goes into the account. It stays in the account. Every contribution you want to make afterward needs to be a minimum of $10. So once you put your $25 in and you get the account open and funded, anytime you want to make another contribution, it needs to be at least $10. You don't have to make contributions at any set point in time. Just know that when you do, it's a minimum of $10. We will also have a preloaded MasterCard available in the next um, month or two. And this preloaded MasterCard will allow for folks to be able to transfer money from their ABLE account to the MasterCard and then use that card anywhere that MasterCard is accepted. When you set your account up, you will link a bank account to it. That can be your personal checking or savings account. Um, it can be any bank account that you're comfortable linking to your ABLE account. And once that linkage is made, you'll be able to easily make automatic contributions or chosen contributions into your ABLE account. You'll be able to make withdrawals from your ABLE account into your personal checking or savings. And you can link up to four accounts at a time. So let's say that the account is being set up by an authorized legal representative. So let's say mom has a child over the age of 18. She's setting up the account. She's managing the ABLE account. She links her bank account. She can also choose to link up the beneficiary's bank account as well to the ABLE so that additional contributions can be made. So there are multiple um, accounts that can be linked to the ABLE account for easy access to contributions and withdrawals. And then Maryland offers an incentive. It is a $2,500 income tax deduction. That is for any Maryland tax filer that is contributing to a Maryland ABLE account. So if I were to set up an ABLE account tomorrow for my daughter and I were to put um, $5,000 into it, I could take a $2,500 tax deduction off of my 2018 taxes. Then if my mom wants to make a contribution to the account, she can do so and she can claim a $2,500 tax deduction off of her state taxes. So it's really about the Maryland tax filer that makes a contribution to the account. So mom and dad can make contributions, grandma and grandpa, friends, family, if they're all Maryland tax filers, they can each claim up to that $2,500 deduction. Another feature of this is there is what's called a 10-year carry forward. So if mom and dad open up the account and they fund $10,000 in this account for the first year. They can claim up to $5,000 on their 2018 taxes. Then when 2019 comes along, they can claim another $5,000 on their 2019 taxes because there's a 10 year carry forward on those contributions. And it's $2,500 per individual tax filer or $5,000 for joint tax filers. Next slide. There is an account maintenance fee associated with the ABLE account. Again, Maryland is one of the lowest across the nation. It is a $35 annual account maintenance fee because these are investment accounts. Um, the, it's prorated, so it's determined based on when you open your account. For our account holders that opened their accounts at the end of December, we had some account holders who received a 29 cent annual account maintenance fee because that's all that was charged because it was based on when they opened their account. So that's something to keep in mind. 
when you open your account, you're not going to be charged that full $35, but it's prorated based on when you open your account. It is also charged in quarterly chunks. So you don't see one $35 fee pulled out of your account. It's charged in quarterly bits. So that at the end of one full calendar year, a total of $35 has been deducted from your account. And there are also asset-based fees on, these in, on the investment options. So that's essentially um, a fee that you're paying but you don't see, depending on the type of investment you choose. Our plan disclosure book that's on our website does outline what those fees are. But essentially, what that looks like is, let's say you've um, contributed $500 into the aggressive investments. Maybe $495 of that money gets attributed to the investment, investment and then $5 is held back as the fee for that. Um, so that is something you can look at in our plan disclosure book because depending on the investment, that determines the amount of the asset-based fees. But those are not fees you see, but they are there, so it's important to be aware of them. Next slide. What are the account types? When I talk about these investments or savings accounts, I know it can be a little confusing. But step-by-step, step, you go into MarylandAble.org, you open up your account, you put your $25 in, and you're ready to put some additional funds in, and you want to decide where those funds go. You have four options in front of you. The first is the cash option. That is essentially, it's an FDIC insured banking product. It's essentially some, the same thing as a checking or savings account. So there's not a lot of return on the cash option. You're not taking any risk with the money, so there's really not a lot of return. But it is a secure banking product. You put your money into it. What you put in stays there. It's not really growing a lot, but there's no chance for loss. That's the cash option. Then you have three investment options in front of you, a conservative, a moderate, and an aggressive. You can choose to take all the money that you want to contribute and put all of it into the cash option. Again, you're not going to have a lot of growth, but you don't take any risk with that money. Or you can choose to put all your money into one of the investment options or you can choose to split it. So you can split your money and put some of it into cash and some of it into the investment. So you really have some flexibility with where your money's going and what you wanna do with it. The investment options are that, they are investments. So you wanna be mindful of the fact that when you're putting money into an investment, there's always the opportunity for loss. There's also the opportunity for growth. And that's something you can keep in mind. And when you go to open your account, you can look at those various investment options in front of you to decide which one you're most comfortable with if you want to put your money into an investment. You will have the opportunity to change your investment options up to two times a year. Uh, that can be done anytime during the year, but you certainly have the ability to change those investments up to twice a year. Next slide, please. What do those investment options look like? The conservative investment is where the majority of your money is going into the purchase of bonds and a smaller amount is going into the purchase of stocks. Your moderate is a 50-50, so half the money in stocks, half in bonds. Your aggressive investment is where 84% of your money is going into stocks, 16% is going into bonds. The more aggressive investment you choose, um, certainly know that that is the greatest opportunity for loss, but it is the greatest opportunity for returns. So that's something you want to think about and how you plan to use your money. If you're putting money into your ABLE account, you really just want to have it there so that the rent can be paid monthly um, or that there's some additional funds available for other needs. In that case, maybe the cash option is the way to go. But if you're really looking at it as a, an investment, a long-term opportunity to grow some money, then really look at those investment options in front of you and decide what you're most comfortable with. Any option you choose, whether you choose investment or cash, regardless, you still have access to that state income tax deduction. So it doesn't matter which of these options you're putting your money into when you open the ABLE account. As long as you have the ABLE account open, 
you can take advantage of the state income tax deduction for the contributions made to the account. Next slide, please. Um, I mentioned earlier the one account per individual. Uh, there is a rollover process for that. So if you were to have an account already open in another state and you want to roll it over into the Maryland plan, or if you have a Maryland account and you want to roll it out into another state, there is a process by which that needs to be done. And so um, certainly we would want you to reach out to us so we can walk you through that process. Next slide. Let's look, dig into what it looks like when you go to open your account so that you have a sense of what is on our website, all of the resources that are available on the site, and all of the support that is available to you during this process. Next slide. When you go to MarylandAble.org, you will see a link at the bottom of the page for the program disclosure booklet. That, that booklet I was talking about that outlines those asset-based fees, it outlines um, what the tax incentives are, it outlines what happens if the beneficiary passes away, it outlines um, what happens if you make a withdrawal from the account that is not a qualified expense. So it gives you all of that information that's really relevant to the ins and outs and um, daily use of the ABLE account. And it's really a good uh, document just to have on hand if you have a question. We also have our frequently asked questions on the website, so you can find a lot of answers to things that have come up in lots of our listening sessions and presentations. Um, certainly not everything is there. And every time I do this presentation, I get a question I've never had before. So there's always the opportunity for us to add to this section. But if you have some questions, you can always check that out to see if there's something that's already been addressed. We also have a live chat feature for our customer support team. When we developed this relationship with our program manager, Bank of New York Mellon, they are they would have been able to provide us with a customer support team that's available Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. And that's a team that you can call, you can live chat with on the website, or you can email. So you have a lot of opportunities to ask them questions. What I do like to advise is if you have questions about benefits or um, state and, um, tax incentives or anything like that, those are questions that either myself or Betty Ann Mobley, the director of the program, would be able to answer. But if you have technical questions about your account or about getting the account set up, um, or you're wondering if a, a contribution has cleared or things like that, the customer support team is the best, they're the best place to go to to get those questions answered because I don't have access to people's accounts or account information. What I can do is answer the bigger questions, but the customer support team is really the team that's there to help you with all of the ins and outs of the account itself. And then from our website, we also have the enrollment link. Go to the next slide, please. When you click on that enrollment link, it's going to take you to a page that says Someday, a BMY Mellon company. Someday is the subsidiary of BMY, and they are the company that manages this online enrollment platform. So it is still part of Maryland ABLE. You haven't left the Maryland ABLE platform. You're just entering into this realm that Someday manages, um, which is this secure online enrollment platform. Next slide. Once you go to enroll it, again, is a really simple process. It takes about 15 minutes to get the account open. But there are a few things that you want to make sure you have. First, the social security number for the beneficiary. Um, and the beneficiary is the individual with the disability. If there's an authorized legal representative that is opening the account, on behalf of the beneficiary, certainly they're going to need their own um, identifying information, like their social security number, address, that sort of information. If the authorized legal representative is opening the account, the system will prompt that person to upload their 
documentation showing that they have either power of attorney or legal guardianship. If the system prompts you to upload it and you don't, you will be allowed to continue setting up the account, but you will not be allowed to fund the account until you send your paperwork in by mail. So that's something to keep in mind. You'll be able to go through the setup process even without uploading that document, but you can't fund it or use the ABLE account until the paperwork is submitted. So, um, you know, you'll have a sort of a shell of an account set up, but you won't be able to use it in any effective sort of way until the paperwork that is required is submitted. And then lastly, you would need the bank account information to link up to the ABLE account. When you um, set up the ABLE account, you're going to want to link that bank account to make the initial $25 contribution to get the account set up. Next slide. And then once you get your account set up, you can go to the Maryland ABLE website to manage your account. You can log in, you can change your investment options, you can check on contributions, you can make withdrawals from your account, you can make contributions into your account. So you really have all of the versatility of online banking at your fingertips once you get your account set up. And I've been talking a lot about going online to set up your account. That is the primary way in which you get your account set up. However, there are a lot of folks that don't want to do this online. They would feel far more comfortable um, doing this, you know, in, by some other method. So we do offer the enrollment forms and all the other required forms, like contribution forms, on our website. Certainly, you can print those off, fill them out and send them in by mail. So you can set up your account by mail or you can do it online. However you choose to set it up is how Bank of New York is going to stay in touch with you. So if you set up your account online, they are going to stay in touch with you by email. That's how they're going to communicate with you. If you set your account up with the paper enrollment form, Bank of New York is going to communicate with you by hard copy letters that come to you. Um, if you decide that you want to set it up by paper, but then eventually you want to set up the online options that you can access it and monitor it and manage it that way, you can do that and then you can opt into just having your communications from BMI Mellon by email instead. Next slide. And again, I mentioned the customer support team. There are a couple ways to get in touch with them. There is the live chat button on the website. You can send them an online request where you ask them to either email you or call you, or you can just give them a call directly at customer support. So there are multiple ways to get in touch with them and to reach out. So that's something that we think is instrumental in making sure that you're managing and accessing your account, and getting all of the support you need during this process. Next slide. I did mention we're going to have this prepaid card available. Um, it should be available by the end of March or early April. It is a prepaid card. So what that means is uh, you allocate a certain amount of money from the ABLE account to be available on the card. So this card does not give access to all of the funds in the ABLE account. It gives the person access to a certain amount of funds in the ABLE account, and you decide how much that's going to be if you were the authorized legal representative. Um, it's a great opportunity for someone who's managing their account and they know they need to you know, purchase certain things to be able to really easily access their ABLE funds so they can you know, decide that they want to make available a couple hundred dollars from their ABLE account to their card. They've got that card available. They can use it anywhere MasterCard is accepted. The only place they cannot use it is an ATM. So you can't take the card to an ATM and pull cash from it. That would, it won't work. But certainly you can use that card anywhere that MasterCard is accepted. There is a $1.25 monthly fee charged to the account 
and that is $1.25 every month that's charged to the account to keep the card active. I do hope that that fee rolls off in the future, um, but right now with the initial startup fees for the prepaid card, it is there. Um, but again, our hope and our intent is to have that fee roll off in the relatively near future. Next slide. I mentioned that we are part of the tax code. So with the new tax reform law that went into effect at the end of December, or was implemented at the end of December, um, there was some able legislation that had been proposed that got lumped in to the tax reform law. And I wanna talk about what that is, because these um, pieces of legislation actually helped to expand some of the impact of able. Next slide. The first is the ABLE Financial Planning Act. What that does is it allows families to roll over money from their 529 college savings plan into an ABLE account. Previously, you could have both, but you couldn't roll over your 529 into the ABLE. Now you can do that. That rollover is still subject to that $15,000 annual cap on the ABLE account. So if you have $30,000 in your 529, you can roll over 15,000 one year and 15,000 the next. Um, but now there is the opportunity to do this rollover. The additional legislation that was included was the Able to Work Act. Essentially that states if you are a working adult with a disability and you are not contributing to a retirement plan through your employer, you can contribute more money into your ABLE account more than that $15,000. So for example, if you have an individual who works a very part-time job, let's say they're earning $5,000 a year in their part-time job, but they're not contributing into any type of retirement plan, a 401k or anything like that, and they have an ABLE account open, they could, once their account hits $15,000, they then had the opportunity to contribute an additional $5,000 into their account because that is equivalent to what their earnings are. So they then had the opportunity to have $20,000 total in their ABLE account. Another example is if you have an individual who is working and they're earning $60,000 a year, but they are not contributing to a retirement plan through their employer. They have their ABLE account open. Their ABLE account has, a, has been contributed to and it's capped at 15000 They have the opportunity to then contribute up to $12,060 into their ABLE account. Um, so it's really based on how much the individual is earning up to a cap of $12,060, and that's tied to the federal poverty level. Um, so this is going to be something that we are working through to implement and make available so that ABLE account holders can go into their account, they can look at their contributions, they can identify how much they are going to earn or anticipate earning for the year, and then it gives them the opportunity to save more money in their ABLE account and then really use that ABLE account as a retirement investment. There was a third piece of legislation. It was not lumped in with the tax reform law, but it has been proposed, and we're following this. Um, there's no decision on it yet, but that is to increase the age limit from 26 to 46. So certainly that would capture people who have developed disabilities a little later in life. Um, that could be great in expanding who can access these ABLE accounts and who can benefit from them. But again, that is still in the proposed mode, so we don't have any decision on that. Next slide. That is a lot of information. It covers the ABLE program pretty thoroughly. If you have questions about the ABLE program, the Maryland ABLE program, you can email questions at marylandable.org. That email box is monitored by myself and Betty Ann Mobley, who is the director. And so daily, we are responding to emails that are coming in. You can always follow us on Facebook or Twitter. 
you can go to our website, check out the Frequently Asked Questions section. But we want you to feel like you can reach out to us if anything comes up, if you have any questions that we're not answering in the process. So with that, that is the end of my presentation. If you have any questions, I think Stacy is going to sort of um, vet them out and we'll go ahead and answer any questions that folks might have right now. Yep, thank you very much, Lori. That was very informative. Um, I, we do have a few questions. Um, I appreciate you all holding them until the end or typing them in as you think of them. Um, one question that we had, it, just as a housekeeping matter, someone asked about getting a copy of this presentation to share. Absolutely. Um, we are recording this presentation. We will be uploading a link to the recording onto the PPMD website at www.ppmd.org. In addition, if you registered for this webinar, we will be sending out a link to the recording as well as a link to a brief evaluation that we would like you to complete. So moving on to some of the more substantial questions. Um, Lori, I think you answered this already, but can you talk a little bit more about the difference between an ABLE account and a special needs trust? Yeah, I, so I'm not a special needs trust expert. Um, but there are some distinct differences that we outline. The first is the cost by which a cost to get an ABLE account open versus special needs trust. Second is how the accounts are managed. An ABLE account we talked about is typically what we say owned and operated by the individual with the disability or the beneficiary. A special needs trust is typically set up on behalf of, an, of the beneficiary. And that trust is managed by someone else. It could be an organization, it could be a trust attorney, but it's managed by someone who is not the beneficiary. Contributions can be made to that special needs trust, but contributions cannot be made by the beneficiary to that special needs trust. Um, a special needs trust has money in the trust. Typically, you ask the trust to disperse funds for certain things that come up. So there is a process by which you are requesting funds, the disbursement is made on behalf of the beneficiary, so there's a bit more of a process behind that, unlike an ABLE account where you have your money in the account, if you need it for a qualified disability expense, you just log in and you withdraw your funds. So there's that sort of ease of accessing the money. A special needs trust, there's three different types of special needs trust, um, but there are some age parameters built on special needs trusts. My understanding is that there are also um, federal and state taxes on earnings in special needs trusts. You don't have that on an ABLE account. But a special needs trust can be highly beneficial when you have families that need to secure real property. So if they want to leave a house to someone, that you go through your trust to do that. Um, or if you want to have money that's going to go into a trust upon the death of a family member, like an inheritance. You can use a trust for that. So there, there are pros and cons to both, and they can both be highly useful. It just depends on the family's needs. That's great, thank you. And just if you guys are looking for more information about special, special needs trust, we do also have a recorded webinar on the website from a Mr. Stephen Elville, who is an attorney here in Maryland. And then I'll tell you a little bit more in just a moment, but on March 14th, we're going to be hosting a webinar from a father of a child with special needs as well as a financial planner, and he's going to be talking about kind of putting it all together with special needs trusts and ABLE accounts and using both to their best advantage. So we can provide some more information about that. Um, we actually have had quite a few questions come in, Lori, about the authorized legal representative. So if you are a parent of a minor child opening an account, are you the default authorized legal representative? Do you have to provide documentation? And then if you are opening an account for your minor child, what do you do once that child turns 18? Do you then have to reopen an account or provide any kind of authorization at that time? Okay, um, so if you are opening the account for a child under the age of 18, you do not need to provide paperwork. Um, you're presumably the legal guardian of that child. Um, the authorized legal representative documentation is only needed if it is for 
someone over the age of 18, so the beneficiary is over the age of 18, and the account is being managed by someone else on their behalf, that's when you need the authorized legal representative paperwork. The second part of that question is what happens when the, the beneficiary reaches the age of 18. And right now the process is that the both the beneficiary and the person that manages the account, so the parent, they are both notified that the account is going to change ownership and become the beneficiary's account. Because by law, once the beneficiary turns 18, they legally own that account. That account is theirs. However, the parent will then have the opportunity to submit ALR documentation if when that child reaches the age of 18, that parent is going to continue to manage the account on that child's behalf. So once they hit the, once that beneficiary hits the age of 18, paperwork needs to be provided, whether it's power of attorney paperwork or legal guardianship paperwork um, for someone else to then manage the account on behalf of the beneficiary. Otherwise, it defaults to the ownership of the beneficiary. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna, in the interest of time, I'm gonna give you the last two questions uh, at once, and then you can answer them as you see fit, and then we'll go ahead and close out, because we do wanna try to keep this um, as to an, about an hour, as close to an hour as we can. Uh, the first of those questions is what happens if the legal representative passes away? Um, who becomes the legal representative then? And then the other question is a request for some more information about the Medicaid payback clause. Um, is this when the person with a disability passes away? And can you just provide a little bit more information about that? So there's, there's two questions, representative passing right. away and Medicaid payback clause. So if the ALR passes, um, I'm going to have to look into that because I think we, when the ALR documentation is submitted, I think there is some identification for a way in which someone else can be identified to serve. So let me let me look into that. What I would say is whoever asked that question, shoot me that at questions at marylandable.org because I'm going to have to get clarification from our attorney just to find out specifically what happens when the ALR passes. Does that mean um, that we successfully asked you a question you hadn't been asked before? Yes. <laughs> I told you every, well, you every know, session kind of I do. Because you said every time you hear a question every. you haven't heard before. <laughs> exactly. And that is exactly the case. Every time I do this, someone asks a question. Um, and then in terms of the Medicaid payback, there, there is one federal provision in that payback that states that if the individual was receiving long-term support services through Medicaid and is over the age of 55 when they pass away, there is a mandate in which um, the state Medicaid program would have to recover a certain amount of funds. It is a very specific um, mandate in the federal law. Other than that, it essentially states that the, you know, the, in terms of the Maryland legislation, that there will be no attempt at recovery. That being said, what um, I would say is email questions at marylandable.org, and when I get a copy of the proposed legislation, I can send it out so that you, you, know, you can see that, um, and then hopefully answer any specific questions you might have. Great. Okay, Lori, thank you very much for your time today. This has been a lot of really great information. Um, just for a few housekeeping items, as Lori stated, if you do have any additional questions, if you think of anything um, upon further thinking or listening to this a second time, then you can certainly email her at the questions at Maryland Able or contact her via Facebook or Twitter, as she said. Um, you can also contact us at Parents Place of Maryland. Um, we will be, um, if you registered for this webinar, you will be receiving a follow-up email, as I said, with a link to the webinar recording, as well as a link to a brief evaluation. Please complete that short survey as soon as you can, as it will help us to continue to bring you these presentations. And we will also be posting the recorded webinar on our website. 
You can also find the recording of the previous webinar that I mentioned, Special Needs Trust and ABLE, What Parents Need to Know on our website. And on March 14th, we will host Eric Jorgensen for putting it all together, Planning Financially for Special Needs. This is also going to be a lunchtime webinar, and the flyer went out today, so keep an eye out for that for registration information. Thank you very much for joining us today, and thank you again, Lori. This was some really great information. Bye, all. Thank you, guys. Bye.